We've been in the middle of a series on promises. We're going to take a break from that this morning for our communion service. There's a verse, these verses that we're turning to have been on my heart for some time, particularly verse 4, just the truth of it just keeps percolating in my heart. And I want to share that this morning. I want to encourage you to get a bulletin. There's a lot of things happening this week, just about every day, and, and for somebody or, or, or some bodies. And so be sure and get a, a, a bulletin. I would like to say we do hand out a physical calendar, but things get changed. If you want an up-to-date on the calendar, just visit the website, and that's the latest up-to-date on our calendar. But don't forget tonight. Sometimes I'm always rushing ahead thinking about what's next week, but don't forget tonight. Come early and pray and fill the prayer room, and let's just believe God to do eternal things in our midst. Amen? And what about tonight? Forget that for a moment. What about the rest of this service? Let's believe the Lord to do great things the remainder of this service. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? Paul is opening his letter to the Galatians and he says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the verse. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. In verse 4, Jesus gave himself for our sins. Those are tremendous words in themselves. But then he gives the purpose of that. That he might deliver us from this present evil world. How many would agree with the Apostle Paul that this present world is evil? we got a problem if the church won't admit to that. I want to preach this morning on he died to deliver. Isn't that what Paul told us? He died to deliver. Heavenly Father, move, O oh Lord, in our hearts through the preaching of your word. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, come and lead and guide thoughts and hearts to feel the challenge and the gratitude. Lord, from this verse, Lord, in this communion service, may the presence of Jesus be, be near and dear to our hearts. May we just be shut up together in His presence. Lord, we thank You for Your goodness and the truth of the gospel, the good news. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. There were a lot of awful scenes that came to us this week from the effects of Hurricane Isaac down south there. And I, I saw just one, uh, I believe the family was, lived in Louisiana, it might have been Mississippi, and I came in upon it just as they were beginning, had already begun to share, didn't catch the, the, the pre-remarks, but the lady was sharing about her family. She said, we were in our house, and the water began to rise up, it, it rose up in the yard, and then it was in the house, and it kept rising higher and higher and higher quickly, just rising higher. And finally, she said, they couldn't even get to the, the crawl space or the opening, you know, to the attic. She said, we had to, to bust through the sheetrock of that room and get into the attic. And then they either, they either, they burst through the end of the gable or the roof. I couldn't quite understand from her words what, but once in the attic, they had to get out on the roof. And then she said, there's these men that came by in a boat and, and, and got us in the boat and got us to safe ground. And, and, you know, that's a sad story to think of the destructive power of that hurricane and the loss of that home. But it's also a noble story to think about how those men went out in a boat and rescued that family. And we feel, we feel victory in that, that they were rescued from such great destruction. But my thought was along these lines. Wouldn't it have been a very foolish and unspeakable and unthinkable thing that if that family perched there on that roof with those hurricane flood waters destroying everything around, wouldn't it have been a foolish thing if when the boat came by, they looked at those men and said, oh, just go on, we're okay, you know, you know don't bother us right now. We're doing fine, you know, and we're still above water and everything. Wouldn't it have been a foolish thing, amen, to, to deny and to refuse the rescue by that boat. 
I want you to know the floodwaters of that hurricane are very much like the awful wickedness and darkness of our world. And it's not only crept up into the very lawns of our homes, it's crept into the very homes. and It's risen and risen and families are in trouble and, and people are in trouble and marriages are in trouble. But thank God Jesus has come, He said, to deliver you from this present evil world. And the best thing that can happen to somebody is to recognize Recognize this present evil world is swallowing them up, destroying them, destroying their family. But to recognize that Jesus has sent the means of rescue through his cross and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord because of what he has done can be rescued and saved and delivered from this present evil world. Oh, what a truth. How many young people have we watched destroyed? How many homes? How many lives? I want to say Jesus has come to save us from this world. We've been walking on Sunday evenings in Acts chapter 2. And I don't know what happened. I guess the, the Holy Spirit was just saving it for this morning. But for two different Sundays, I meant to emphasize these verses, this verse. And both Sunday nights, I just went right over it, never emphasized it. And I guess, again, the Holy Spirit saved it for this service. But in Peter's message in Acts chapter 2, verse 40, the Scripture tells us about that and said, With many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. I can take that from Peter's mouth 2,000 years ago, and it's applicable today to say to people, Save yourselves. From this untoward generation. Another version puts it this way. He went on in this vein for a long time. Urging them over and over. Get out while you can. Get out of this sick culture. I hear that message today. You know we ought to realize that this age. The mainstream of people, the into what's trending crowd, the with it generation, that generation, the present generation, the present world is always lost. It's always perishing. It's always headed to hell. And anybody ought to recognize that and say, no, I don't want to be a part of that. That which is fashionable, in, trendy, in vogue is the very thing that's killing people and destroying the fabric of our society and wrecking our marriages. What I'm sharing may seem terribly old fashioned to you but I'm convinced it's the truth and I just believe Paul's words Jesus died for my sins to save me from this present evil world. Amen. Brother Michael on the monitors. And I want to just emphasize that Jesus came to save us from this world. Let's look at this verse. That he might deliver us from this present evil world. You know, this verse, I want you to just look at it with me. Because it really stands on head how we often hear the gospel presented. We often hear the gospel presented, Jesus came to save us from hell. Isn't that normally the thrust of the message? Jesus came to save us from hell. But that's not what Paul said. Paul said he came to save us, deliver us from this present evil world. I'll tell you why. If Jesus can't save me from this world, he can't save me from hell. But if he can save me from this world, he can save me from hell. Oh, hallelujah. Aren't you glad he came to do it? This verse Shouts a protest, I believe, to the worldly church and the worldly believers. You know, one of the things that I find perplexing in our age is we have churches and believers who actually condone the things of this world, the lifestyle of this world, the sins of the world. And that is ironic to me that the church of today will condone the very things Jesus died to save people from. Think about it. 
I wonder how true of a salvation has taken place in a person's life when there's no demarcation between the world and the church. No demarcation between the life of an unbeliever and the life of a believer. I'm convinced that it will not ring true, but it will ring false and ineffective when believers try to live as closely as possible to the very world Jesus died to deliver them from. I think there's there's a gratitude in the heart of the genuinely saved that says I want to stay as far away from that world Jesus saved me from that I can because he had to die to get me out of there. And if he died to get me out of there for for his sake, I sure want to stay out. This verse shouts a protest to the self-help, prosperity, pseudo-church of our age. We're living in a time when across the airways you hear over and over, and and I'll bullet it down uh, for you. You hear the message that Jesus came to make you wealthy. Jesus came so you could have a better job, a bigger automobile, and a fancier house. If I read this scripture correctly, Jesus didn't come to give me the stuff of the world. Jesus came to save me from it. Hallelujah. Jesus didn't come so I could reach my full potential potentiality and make it big and big time in this world he came to deliver me from this world keep me from being a part of it so that when this world's on fire I'll be in another place amen I believe this verse also shouts a protest to the environmentalists the liberal mindset I think they have it all backwards the problem isn't really that we're destroying this world the problem is this world is destroying us. Amen. The liberals are all concerned about saving the world from people, but Jesus came to save people from this world. I know I'm making a play on words. I know that when they say world, they're talking about planet and geology. But what I'm talking about is what's happening on this planet and what's happening on this geology. Amen. I believe in being a good steward. Amen. But more than this world being saved from people. People need saved from this world. Can you say amen? Amen. That crowd's concerned about killing the polar bears. Jesus knows that this world kills even the righteous man. The psalmist said, oh, for the godly man ceaseth. People's concerned about this endangered species. And I'm not saying they shouldn't be. I'm giving you an illustration. They're concerned about this endangered species, this endangered slug, this endangered butterfield, uh, butterfield, butterfly. Amen. But the psalmist said, I'm concerned about the endangered righteous man. I'm concerned about the endangered godly person. They're concerned about eating up the ozone. But Jesus knows this world is consuming the innocence of young people, the lives of folks, the very souls of man. Amen. They are concerned about this earth heating up, the temperature getting hotter Amen. But if I read the Bible, the thing we ought to be concerned about is that it tells us one day the heavens and earth will pass away with a great noise and the elements shall burn and melt with fervent heat. More than I'm concerned about the the natural temperature rising, I'm concerned about folks not being prepared for the day when this world catches on the fire of the judgment. I told you, you may find it terribly old-fashioned, but it's still in what Paul said. Jesus came and he died to save us from this present evil world. I have a question. If we act, I'm talking about believers, if we act like, look like, participate in, love this world, how can any know, including ourselves, that we've been saved from it? And then in this verse, Knowing that he came to die to rescue us from this world, we got to understand this world is certainly something to be saved from. This world is something to be saved from. Again, in that verse, notice just this present evil world. Now look, I believe there's much beauty in this world, much beauty and good, wherever it retains the original creation of God. But this world gets ugly where sin has been. This world gets nasty 
where evil has come. Because of sin, because of Satan, because of the fallen man, there's much ugliness, darkness, corruption, filth, and pollution. This present evil world. How many knows the news cast each day verifies what I'm talking about? How just evil, how evil and corrupt and fallen and wicked and ugly this world is. It's on the news every day. So this world is something to be delivered from. I'm not going to suppose and indulge myself to believe anyone will remember it. It's interesting how that thing, that thing goes. There was a sermon I thought I preached a year ago. I got to look and it was four years ago. And so I don't know when I preached this, but how are you? No, I shouldn't have asked you. I said I wasn't going to. But sometime back I preached a message. This world is not your friend. Folks need to be aware. Of, this world is not your friend. This world is not a safe or a healthy place. This world's not a greenhouse. This world is a desert. Even you look at the world, its pleasures are only a veneer for its pains. Its liberties only turn to bondages. Its attractions are bait to its snares. Its addictions destroy not only the body, but the very soul. This world world is something to be delivered from in the bible i'm not going to bore you but i've got to be fair here the bible originally used two main different words for world one was ion we get our word eon from from this an age the other was cosmos now that meant it could be the planet the globe it could mean the people of the world for god so loved the world it's the people of the world or the, the, the main meaning we're using today, world could also mean that system of evil whereby Satan exerts his control. Where Satan has been and has moved and has planned and designed. You know, I want you to think about that. Where most of us are familiar with how the mafia works. Now it's these drug cartels and from down south. But they'll move in and under the surface of a town. They'll get their candidates in the town council. They'll buy off the mayor. They'll get their hand and ever behind the scenes and ever little part of that civil government. They'll even get the, the policeman and buy him off. And they'll build their businesses and they control the gambling and the prostitution. They even control good businesses with kickbacks. And there it is, the mafia behind the scene. And some people are concerned about that. I'm not saying we shouldn't be concerned about the mafia or drug cartels. But there's a bigger power at work. The very power of Satan behind the scene. And he's got a tentacle in ever arena of the life. And he's planning and he's designing to entrap and to destroy and to take over and ruin the lives of people. And that's what the world is. It's the rule and the reign of Satan. This world is headed for destruction and going to hell and it wants to take you with it. But Jesus has come that we can be saved. Hallelujah. We don't have to be taken by this world to destroy. We can be saved. How many is glad you're saved this morning? Wherever you are, whoever you are, this world does affect you. It does influence you. It does take a toll on you. How many could understand this if I were to say sometimes you can even take a trip to the mall and feel like you need a spiritual bath when you come out? The influence of this world. The world targets you. Every commercial. Everything of this commercial world. Amen. Every demon. Amen. We ought to know this. Jesus said, The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and destroy. Now hang on here because he also said, But I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But I want you to think, Satan does not hunt us with bow and arrow. He hunts us with this world. He sets the world on our trail. He plays music for the ears of our flesh. He paints scenes for the eyes of our carnality. We need to be delivered from this world. 
I'm going to do this very quickly. And I want you to follow along, if you will, on the wall. I want to show us what it is about this world that we need delivered from, we need saved from. First of all, we need saved from the control of this world. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. Where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. In other words, when you're in the world, you're under the power of the world. And the ultimate head of that power is Satan. He rules and controls this world. 1 John 5, 19. We know that we're of God. Anyone here know that you're of God? What were we singing? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm a child of the King. We know that we're of God, but the whole world lieth in wickedness. Amen. The the, the Greek actually paints the picture. The whole world is in the lap of Satan. He's got control of it. We need to be saved from the darkness of this world. Ephesians 6 and 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. This world is dark. We need delivered from the cares of this world. Amen. Jesus said the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choketh the word and it becometh unfruitful. Just dealing with the pressures of life, we become jaded, burned out. We begin to seek a distraction in the world and in its sins. We become bitter and hardened and hatred in our heart just from the cares of this world. We need saved from the offenses of this world. Jesus said in Matthew 18 and verse 7, Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. People hurt people. There's offenses of this world. How many knows we need saved from the hatred of this world? The hatred of this world. Jesus said in John 7, The world cannot hate you. That's that's pre them becoming like Christ. The world cannot hate you, but me it hates hateth because I testify of it. Then in John 15 and 19 if you were of the world the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world but I have chosen you out of the world therefore the world hateth you. Remember this if we get to tonight's sermon. If you really make up your mind to live for God the world will hate you. That's just the way it's designed. I've heard one commentator say over and over this is not it's an illustration but he said the mistake that conservatives make is that they want the media to like them and they try to make the media like them but they're never going to like them it's a big mistake to try to make the world like you and like Christianity. It doesn't like Christianity. It's never going to like Christianity. Hallelujah. Someone said if they're not listening well uh, uh, today, preacher, get a chair out there and just preach to the chair. That that happened somewhere this week. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. The hatred of the world. Amen. And then we need saved from the God ignorance of this world. To the world, God has become nothing but a curse word. Jesus said, O righteous, Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. We need saved from the pressure of this world. How many knows there's some pressure going on in this world? Even Romans 12, 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be it transformed. I mean, the word conformed means don't be pressed into the mold. In other words, the world has put a pressure on us to try to pressure us into its mode to be like it. Amen. But Paul said you can be delivered from the pressure of this world. You don't have to be conformed to this world. You can be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need to be saved from the spirit of this world. Again, Ephesians chapter 2. If you'll look there, it said there was a time that we walked according to the course, according to the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. I want to save this and move right on. But as certainly as there is a Holy Spirit to speak to us and influence us, there is a worldly spirit to speak to us and influence us. Guess whom I want to listen to? I want to listen to the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. We need to be saved from the fashion 
of this world. Amen. 1 Corinthians 7, they that use this world is not abusing it. For the fashion of this world passeth away. We don't have to dress and look like we came out of the 1800s, but we're not trying to be the popular in crowd. Amen. We're, bit, we're followers of Jesus. We need saved from the things of this world. 1 John chapter 2, love not the world, neither the things are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We need saved from the sorrow of this world. 2 Corinthians 7. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world, the grief, the discouragement, the despair, the sorrow of this world worketh death. We need to be saved from the elements of this world. Galatians chapter 4. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. What's the elements? It's the things of the world and how the world works. We need to be saved from the filth of this world. James chapter 1 and verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows and their affliction, affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. James said this world, it'll get you dirty. It'll blacken your life, your mind, and your heart. But Paul said he's come to save us from the filth of this world. Oh, are you glad? How many is glad you can be clean through the blood of Jesus? Glory to God. Amen. What, why are you going through all this? I'm building a case. Hallelujah. I'm building a case. We need to be saved from the friendship with this world. James said in chapter 4, you adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy with God. Amen. We need to be saved from the corruption of this world. Second Peter chapter 1, whereby this was one of our theme scriptures for promises, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption corruption that's in the world through lust. There's a corruption in this world like rust that will eat you like bacteria that will spoil you. It's a corruption that eats away at your very soul. We need to be saved from the pollutions of this world. Second Peter chapter 2 for if after that they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ they are entangled therein and overcome again entangled therein and overcome the latter end is worse with them than the beginning pollutions of this world we hear all the time pollutions will make you sick they'll, they'll aggravate your allergies I know in the newspaper and on the telecast they have reports they have a pollen count and a mold count and a small count. But if we could see a scale of the pollution of this world, it'd be through the top of the roof. And that pollution is sickening and diseasing the souls of people. We need to be saved from the false prophets in this world. First John chapter 4 and verse 1. Beloved, believe not ever spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. They're out there. How many knows they're out there? We need to be saved from the spirit of the Antichrist in this world. Again, first John chapter 4. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is come in the flesh is not of God and this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof you have heard that it should come and even now it's already in this world John said that in his time 2,000 years ago you can rest assured that that spirit of Antichrist is at work in this world today. He's here. I'm talking about why we need to save from this world. I mean, there's others, but let me give you one more. Because of the deceivers in this world. Second John. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. There's deceivers in this world. Amen. Amen. That's what concerns me. Have I built a case from God's Word? I mean, the case is there. But have I presented the case from God's world, Word that this world is something to be saved from? 
And that's why it is the good news that He died for our sins to deliver us from this present evil world. I've seen folks begin to do things that are in mesh and in step with this world. And you talk with them and they say, I don't see anything wrong with it. I want to look at them and say, but it's this world that's destroying folks. Why would we want to be in step with it? Then I want us to notice, Jesus paid a great price to save us from this world. Look what it says in verse 4. Who gave Himself that He might deliver us from this present evil world. He gave. How did He give Himself? We're about to take communion in just a few moments. I'm about done. Thank you, Brother Brian. But on that night that Jesus instituted this Last Supper, He took the bread and broke it knowing that just hours later they would take His physical body and they would break His body. Now what you think about that. I hope from God's Word we, we see this this morning. Every time, every time a believer begins to get in step with this world and drift to this world, they ought to in their minds go back and say, wait a minute. When they drove that crown of thorns upon his head and those spikes within his hands and beat his back and hung him there, he allowed them to do that to him to save them from the world they're drifting towards. That's sobering. He said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Hear the word given for you? And now Paul said, he gave himself to save us from this present evil world. You see, Jesus recognized, and Paul did too, that it's our involvement. It's our embracing of this world that has led to sin. It was our sin that held us to this world. And so Paul is saying, and I am saying, how can we love and participate in and embrace the very thing that Jesus died to set us free from? What does that say of my appreciation to all that He did on the cross to embrace a world He died to save us from? You know, it's sobering to me to reconsider that it was my sins that crucified Him. That's a hard thing. It wasn't the spikes through His hands that killed Him. It was my sins on His back. That's what got Him. And you know how did I largely have those sins? It was through my participation in this world that I sinned the sins that broke His heart and His back and killed Him on the cross. Oh, don't you feel gratitude this morning that He gave Himself? You say, why are you taking this tack? Because I believe it's the message of the hour that those that have been saved by this wonderful act of His death ought to look and say, I don't want any part of that thing that He died to save me from. Oh, just a couple more things here. It's through the accepting of His grace that He's able to save us from this world. All through this, God does not drive us into salvation. He doesn't even make us jump through hoops and crawl across broken uh, glass on our knees. How do we have this wonderful deliverance from the world? How do we obtain this wonderful salvation? Through the accepting of His grace. Oh, are you glad it's by grace this morning?
Look what it says back in verse 3. That's why he began the epistle. Grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not looking at folks or even Christians that are in the world and saying, you need a spanking, you need whipped, you, you, you need your ears boxed. Even when I see folks involved in this world, I'm looking at them and saying, oh, what you need. You need grace and mercy and peace to come from heaven and to flood your soul when your soul is flooded for grace, all you want is Jesus. You don't want that world. When your soul is flooded with the mercies of the Lord and His compassions, you don't want what's out there. You want more, more, more of Jesus, His love, His grace, and His mercy. Hasn't He been gracious to us? Hasn't He been merciful to us? It's through His grace and mercy that we can receive this wonderful salvation. And then last of all, I want us to know this. Knowing by grace through His death that we're delivered from this world should bring the deepest of praise from our hearts. Notice what Paul says here. To whom be glory forever and ever. He's talking about Jesus dying to deliver us from this world. And it causes him to burst out. To him be glory forever and ever. Oh. Hallelujah. You say, oh, I heard that. He died to save me from the present world. I've got to give up this world. That's a horrible thing. Oh, no, it ought not to be that response. It ought to be He died to save me from this world that's trying to destroy me. Hallelujah. Praise His name. Glorious His name. To Him, the Father who planned it all. To the Son who was willing to execute it all. To Him be glory forever and ever. Oh, hallelujah. There's no one that's more fearful with worship than those who are truly aware of what Jesus died to save them from. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe the greatest of worship celebrations can occur when we partake of communion like we're going to do this morning and knowing that it was by His death we have been set free from the world that was destroying us. It's in that gratitude that everything in us hates the wicked world and seeks to shun it. Would you come music? I want to be singing this morning. I saw a little bit of a documentary. Not something I would normally watch but I don't even know how I got there I didn't get that much of it I'm still in suspense but a puppy got into a house's sewer pipes and when they tried to get it it kept going further and further and further till it was about 100 feet from the house they called not Rotorooter they called the fire department it, it, you could tell it was daylight hours. And the fire department got up on the roof and put the little camera snake down through the vent. And they got shovels out. They kept digging in the backyard where the sewer line was and breaking into it. The puppy kept moving further and further. Finally, they cut through the fence at nighttime and brought in a backhoe, dug a big expanse out, broke in there, stuck that snake in there 100 something feet. And this time, when the, they could see it, of course, through the, the camera. This time when the puppy saw that light there, he, as they pulled the snake out, that puppy just kept following it until it got to the place they had dug down and broke it in. And, and then, but, but right before someone reached in and pulled him out, it said that one of the firemen took a garden tool and blocked right behind the puppy. And the quote was, so he wouldn't turn around and go back in the sewer. Hallelujah. They lifted that puppy out. Now look, that's God's creation. That's a wonderful thing. 
And we ought to feel all fuzzy and warm about that. No pun intended. But think of the great expense and effort they went through to save a puppy from death. But I want us to think this morning, this communion service, what a great expense and effort Jesus went through to save us from this world. And you know what I think he likes to do if we'll allow him? When he's brought us out of the sewer of this world, I, like, I think he likes to drop down a big garden tool, if you please, of grace and mercy and just block it off. That when we look at where he's brought us from, we're so grateful we just won't be going back there. Have you ever had that happen? The world was calling. The world was pulling. And God suddenly just dropped down a garden tool of grace and mercy. Oh, hallelujah. Let's praise Him across the board. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Lord, do the work of the eternal Spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said for a while, actually it's been years that this verse has captivated me. And this morning, would you come, servers? This morning when we're partaking of communion and we're holding the emblems of His broken body and His blood, I want us to think about it a little differently. Hear me. Please hear these final words. As we hold those elements, think. Jesus died and suffered to save me from this world. And see if that doesn't flood your soul with a conviction. If He died to save me from it, I want no part of it. Amen. Amen. Let's meditate. We'll wait till everyone's been served and then we will and then we will partake together. But let's meditate. Let, let, let the Holy Spirit bring Jesus very near to our hearts. We're doing this in remembrance of Him. Let's just do some remembering today of what He's done for us. Once I was straight Let's go.